All right, what I'd like to do is just talk with you a little bit today about one of the most common problems we see in endocrinology, and that's the problem of multinodular goiter. Today we're going to look a little bit at the prevalence, talk a little bit about the pathophysiology, try not to get too tedious with that. We'll discuss the natural history, what little we know about the true natural history of multinodular goiter. And then we're going to focus in on three specific key clinical issues, the risk for cancer, risk for compressive symptoms, and the issue of possible hyperthyroidism and how that affects how we manage multinodular goiter. We'll look at some cases to discuss those areas. And then we'll look at treatment options as well. Now, what's the overall frequency with which we see thyroid nodules in general? Well, in about 6.5% of women and about 1.5% of men, there's a palpable thyroid nodule detectable if you do a good thyroid exam on them. This frequency increases somewhat as a person ages. It's more common in areas of iodine deficiency, and it's definitely more common in individuals who've had a history of x-ray therapy or, or radiation therapy to their head or neck, particularly during infancy or childhood, particularly so if you were an infant or a child less than 12 years of age downwind from a nuclear accident, such as Chernobyl. And we have had some residents here that grew up in Belarus uh, and were affected by Chernobyl. Now, when we see a thyroid nodule, we have to take into consideration, well, what could it be? Well, I just want to emphasize that about 95% of thyroid nodules are benign. There's a variety of benign causes, one of the most important of which is multinodular goiter. Only about 5% of thyroid nodules in unselected cases, in just all comers, will prove to be malignant. Autopsy studies show that almost 50% of individuals who come to autopsy and die for non-thyroid related uh, reasons have thyroid nodules present, if you look carefully on, a, on an autopsy. Surprising thing, we think we're pretty good about picking up thyroid nodules on phys physical exam particularly when they're over a centimeter. But the autopsy studies show us that 35% of nodules over two centimeters hadn't even been appreciated during the patient's, during the individual's life. Ultrasound studies pretty much support the autopsy studies. They show a prevalence of thyroid nodules somewhere between 20 and almost 50%. And the rate in middle-aged women is around 50% or even a little better. The other thing that ultrasound shows us is that when a patient presents with what appears clinically to be a solitary thyroid nodule on physical exam, if you do an ultrasound, almost half of those patients will have additional nodules that aren't appreciated on physical exam and therefore, by definition, have a multinodular thyroid gland. So multinodular goiter in general is a more complex and a little bit more challenging disorder than solitary thyroid nodule. We really don't understand the pathophysiology completely, but I'll go over with you in just a second a little bit about what we think we know. The evaluation is a little bit more complicated than that for a solitary thyroid nodule, but we'll go through that on a couple of cases here in a moment. The natural history really is not completely worked out. There are a couple of studies that have looked at this, but surprisingly few. And the optimal treatment is still somewhat controversial, and we'll go over some of those controversies. There are some uh, studies that have looked at the prevalence of multinodular goiter in populations. We know that the probability of having multinodular goiter increases in areas of iodine deficiency. It increases with age, with female sex, and surprisingly, it also increases with cigarette smoking. The Framingham data showed that about 1% of the persons in that study, between the ages of 30 and 59 years of age, had multinodular goiter present by palpation. Similar Connecticut studies showed that the prevalence is about 2%. Now, in areas of iodine deficiency, such as Northern Europe, particularly in Denmark, in areas that are mildly iodine deficient, the prevalence is about 10%. In more significant iodine deficient areas, it goes up to about 15%. That's by palpation. If you look by ultrasound, those numbers are 15% and almost 23% respectively. The Wickham study, which was a comprehensive survey in England, in Northern England, of about 2,700 persons in the 1970s. Now that area may still have been somewhat mildly iodine deficient, at least in some of those individuals when they were growing up. Showed an obvious goiter by palpation and visible, when you just looked at the patient, in about 6.9% of the population. The female to male ratio was over four to one. A similar survey in Singapore showed the prevalence was almost 3%. So that gives you a little bit of, of a feel for how common multinodular goiter actually is. Now, what causes multinodular goiter? We don't understand entirely, and I'll tell you in a moment what I tell my patients, but let's go through 
what, what the science suggests, at least now. We know that thyroid hormone formation is a fairly complex process. There's a lot of areas where it can be interfered with or where it can go wrong. And it appears that a variety of things that affect thyroid hormone formation, including iodine deficiency, a variety of complex but subtle partial genetic defects and a number of uh, genes that control thyroid hormone formation, environmental goitrogens, toxins or drugs, any of these things, and, and often in combination, lead to subtle inefficiencies or deficiency in the effectiveness of the thyroid in its ability to make thyroid hormone. When that happens, because of the tight feedback loop, you get a subtle increase in TSH. It may not actually go outside the lab normal range, but it will be subtly increased. And we think that subtle, persistent increase in TSH plays an important role in the pathogenesis of the formation of multiple nodules. We know that TSH stimulates all aspects of thyroid hormone function, including tends to lead to an increase in thyroid cell turnover and hyperplasia of the cells. This causes increased cell turnover, and we think that increased cell turnover increases the rate of somatic mutagenesis. Now, with somatic mutations, you can have a variety of things happen. Some good, some not so good, but basically at least some of those mutations may result in local growth advantage for certain clones of the cells, and with time, those cells tend to have a growth advantage and proliferate more, and you tend to get formation of discrete nodules. And it's not as simple as that, but that, that sort of is the basic framework. With hyperplasia of the thyroid under the influence of increased TSH, a couple other things happen. You get some increased hydrogen peroxide production and increased free radical formation, and that probably leads to a greater susceptibility, particularly in the thyroid, of uh, damage to genomic DNA during the, the hyperplasia. The higher cell replication rate may also affect the ability of the cells to repair random mutational damage as the hyperplasia is occurring. And some of those mutations, as I mentioned, induce growth advantage, particularly those that affect the TSH receptor. You can get some constitutive partial activation of the TSH receptor, and that can lead to focal growth and, and nodule formation. Also in a proliferating thyroid, we know from studies that local growth factors are increased. And this may affect uh, the tendency to, to get further uh, focal growth. There's, uh, as the thyroid grows and enlarges, um, often you can get some local necrosis, uh, focal hemorrhage. This can lead to cyst formation and or fibrosis as time goes on, and that causes further heterogeneity in the goiter growth and further irregularity, nodule formation, and so forth. Now, some of the functional mutations that occur not only cause nodule growth, but they can also cause focal uh, autonomous hormone form uh, formation. So the gland starts to make hormone even without TSH stimulation. As that occurs, that's, that's really the definition of autonomy. The gland is now forming hormone beyond or outside the normal feedback control from the pituitary. And as that occurs, you start to see a suppressed TSH, and it can even lead to hyperthyroidism, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Now, that whole process is more or less the process that occurs. Um, when a patient asks me, Doc, why do I have this multinodular goiter? I don't try to go through all that. Basically, what I tell them, I said, look, I said, we don't understand entirely what causes a multinodular goiter. I said, but the thyroid's about like everything else. As you get older, it tends to get lumpy bumpy. And that's about <laughs> as good as the explanations I have for them. But anyway, we think that, that that process is probably contributed to largely, at least in non-endemic goiter, where you don't have significant iodine deficiency. And most of your multinodular goiter is felt to be not due specifically to the iodine deficiency in that area. So in non-endemic multinodular goiter areas, we think that underlying genetic susceptibility plays a very important role. And that is indeed supported by genetic linkage studies and by twin studies. There's a, we, we think that there are probably subtle abnormalities in some of the genes that control thyroid hormone formation. And those subtle abnormalities don't cause a complete block at one point, which can happen, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute, um, with specific hereditary goiter, you can get a, a full defect in one gene. But we think what happens is there's variations in these genes and they interact to make the gland susceptible to other environmental influences. And we'll look at that interaction in just a moment. In female monozygotic twins, the concordance rate in endemic goiter, in areas where there is iodine deficiency, is 80%. The concordance rate for non-endemic goiter is about 42%. And compare that to dizygotic female twins, those numbers are 40 and 13% respectively. 
And based on some fancy studies that I don't understand entirely, they call them path analysis, structural equation modeling, it's estimated that heritability may be as high as 82%. Now, there's, I, I mentioned the fact that it can be partial defects in these variety of genes that control thyroid hormone formation. There's genes that control iodine transport. You have to get iodine into the gland to form thyroid hormone. You have to identify the iodine. You have to combine the iodine with a protein called thyroglobulin. Then you have to be able to recycle iodine as thyroglobulin is uh, uh, reabsorbed and cleaved and then hormone is secreted. You get iodine that's released and you have to be able to recycle that and use iodine efficiently. Uh, efficiently. And the target tissues have to be able to respond normally to thyroid hormone. And you can get subtle defects in any of these areas. Now, in contradistinction to these subtle defects that probably have a complex interactive effect, you can get specific full mutations of a particular gene. An example of that, and I put this up because you may see this on your boards, is something called Pendridge syndrome. It's an interesting syndrome. It's a specific mutation in the PDS gene. And this gene forms a protein called Pendrin. And when that is fully defective, it's autosomal recessive, but when you have a defect in both of the genes for that protein, you get a condition called Pendridge syndrome, which shows up with hypothyroidism, significant goiter, and sensorineural death, deafness. Now, I don't know why they like to put these kind of syndromes on board questions, but my experience is in that if there's any kind of syndrome that's associated with deafness, it tends to show up on your board. So now you know about Pendridge syndrome. Okay, so this just shows you, summarizes the interaction. So you have environmental factors, your level of iodine intake, smoking, certain drugs such as lithium can interfere with thyroid hormone formation. There are natural goitrogens, which I'll show you a slide on in just a moment, and other things combined with these subtle genetic susceptibilities, and they interact in ways we don't entirely understand, particularly in female individuals, the risk is higher, and you end up having nodular formation in the thyroid over time. Now, some of the environmental goitrogens. These are some compounds that we actually eat a fair amount of. Now, the, the good news is that if you eat modest amounts of these items, if your diet's not predominantly made up of one of these for most of your carbohydrate or, or, or food intake, then it, and, and if you don't have significant underlying genetic abnormalities in your thyroid hormone formation, then your body compensates for this modest effect of these foods very well, and they don't have any clinical effect. But in some places in Africa, the majority of the carbohydrate intake is made up of cassava. And in those situations, it can interfere with thyroid hormone to the extent it may, in, particularly in areas of borderline iodine deficiency, will increase the rate of goiter. Uh, interestingly, if you're iron deficient, just in case we have any hematologists here, if you're iron deficient, there is a heme-dependent thyroid peroxidase. So if you're iron deficient, it does affect thyroid hormone formation a little bit. It's not just all anemia. Um, selenium deficiency can also interfere with thyroid hormone synthesis. Now, in the United States, selenium deficiency really isn't an issue. In some areas in China, it can be. Now, I told you that we don't completely know the full natural history of multinodular goiter. You would think we would, but it, it's still somewhat um, less than completely worked out. We know that overall the natural history tends to be that of a tendency to gradually increase in size, to develop multiple nodules over time, and then to gradually develop some autonomous function and sometimes even hyperthyroidism. The catch is that we really don't know in an individual whether or not they'll continue to progress, how fast they'll continue to progress in this increase in the size of the thyroid, and whether or not a given individual will ever, ever develop clinically significant hyperthyroidism or not. And that makes planning treatment quite challenging. The long-term growth of multinodular goiter is, is not studied as well as we would like, but there are some studies that have looked at it, and based on mostly cross-sectional data, and based on some ultrasound scanning follow-up, it appears it is an average growth rate across all comers of about 4.5%. The problem is that growth rate is highly unpredictable. And even in a given individual, they may progress in size for a period of time and then have a rest of the growth for some reason that we don't understand and not necessarily continue to enlarge significantly further. And that does make planning treatment difficult. So in a given individual, it's hard to predict, particularly in an older individual who presents with a significant goiter and maybe minimal or no symptoms at this time. But you, you think if this continues to enlarge, they're going to have trouble later. And right now, they're 65 years of old and in decent shape. They could go to surgery if they needed to. In 10 years, are they going to get to the point where it's really necessary to make an intervention? And are they going to then have greater 
potential medical issues that might deal, uh, interfere with their uh, candidate for surgery. So it, it becomes difficult to decide when to pull the trigger and to go ahead for definitive treatment. Now we also have a greater appreciation of this tendency to become autonomous and even subclinically hyperthyroid, clinically hyperthyroid over time. And so because we know that even borderline hyperthyroidism is not good for the heart, it increases the risk of tachyarrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation. It may increase the risk of cardiac death even. And it definitely is not good for the bones, particularly in postmenopausal women. So we get more concerned about even mild or borderline subclinical hyperthyroidism, particularly in older individuals. So that becomes an issue also that we have to deal with. There is a study, it was done in the Netherlands. This tends to be better studied in the Netherlands for some reason. But the authors there had a group of 140 patients with multinodular goiter, and 90 of the initial group were available for follow-up. 79 of them were women, 11 were men. And at baseline, 64 of those individuals already had autonomous function, meaning that the TSH was at least subtly decreased or the TSH response to the thyrotropin-releasing hormone was sub subnormal. In other words, there was already some tendency of the gland to start to make hormone independent of TSH control. So 64 of them were already autonomous. 26 were non-autonomous, or essentially still forming thyroid hormone under normal feedback control. And over five years, six of the patients transitioned from normal to autonomous, that's about 23%, and eight of the patients transitioned from autonomous to, frankly, hyperthyroid, based on a completely suppressed TSH, and that's about 12.5%. So that's significant, and we have to keep that in mind when we're following these patients, particularly older patients. So what do we do when we're presented with a patient with multinodular goiter? Well, after we do a reasonable history and physical exam, the first step is to make sure you've measured a TSH. Because if the TSH is suppressed, then you know you've already got significant autonomy and even subclinical hyperthyroidism that has to be dealt with. If the TSH is borderline subnormal, then that suggests they're probably beginning to develop autonomy. We then get an ultrasound of the thyroid and make sure we've characterized the number, the size, and the characteristics of the nodules that are present. If the TSH is suppressed, then we consider going ahead and getting the thyroid scan and 24-hour radioactive iodine uptake, but those studies are not needed if the TSH is not suppressed. Measurement of serum thyroglobulin is not recommended. I want to emphasize that. It really doesn't add anything to the evaluation. It does not give you any information as to whether or not a nodule may be cancer or not. Now, whether or not to measure calcitonin that's not routinely recommended, but if you have a family history of MEN or a family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, then certainly you would measure calcitonin. And there may be special situations where you get some atypical findings on FNA that you may want to measure it. But it's not routinely measured, at least in the United States generally. The best method of evaluation of a suspicious or large thyroid nodule in the presence of a multinodular order is the same as that for a solitary nodule, is fine needle aspiration. So what are the three main clinical issues you have to address when you're faced with a patient with a clinically significant multinodular goiter? First question you have to ask yourself, could cancer be present? Second question is, is the goiter causing any local neck symptoms? Is it affecting swallowing? Is it affecting the airway? Or might it affect those areas in the near future? Is it hyperfunctioning? And then you have to deal with those issues. So the first case, we'll come right at you with it. All right, this is a 54-year-old female who presented with two-month history of some swelling in her neck. She didn't have any local neck pain, she didn't have dysphagia, didn't have any choking cessation, and she hadn't noticed any unusual hoarseness. Her past medical history was typical for the patients you usually see in internal medicine. She had type 2 diabetes and increased cholesterol. She hadn't had any surgery in the past. She was on metformin and pioglitazone for her diabetes. She was a non-smoker, she didn't drink alcohol. Her family history was negative for known thyroid disorders. So what other history might you want at this point? Well, you, we've already established that she doesn't have local neck symptoms. We want to ask her about whether she's had any history of radiation therapy to her head, neck, and chest, particularly during childhood or infancy. We want to, ex to specifically ask whether there's been any family history of a first-degree relative with thyroid cancer, because that would significantly increase the risk of any given nodule being cancer. Then we want to ask about symptoms of hyper or hypothyroidism. And then on the physical exam, we want to look at the patient generally. I always ask my residents that are working with me, I say, first thing I want to know is what did the patient look like? Just 
you, you, there's a lot of physical exam done just walking in the room and looking at the patient. So does the patient look clinically euthyroid? Is there any good neck and he head and neck exam? Is there any cervical adenopathy? Is the thyroid enlarged symmetrically? Is there a specific palpable nodule that's dominant? So we look closely at those things. This patient had a symmetrically enlarged uh, thyroid. There was a suggestion of a dominant nodule in the right mid-pole of the thyroid, in the right mid-part of the right thyroid lobe. The patient had normal respirations. There wasn't any hint of strider. And the rest of the physical exam was unremarkable except for her obesity. So what we, should we do next? So the first thing we have to think about, what's the risk of cancer in this situation? So in general, as I mentioned earlier, the overall risk for cancer in a multinodular goiter is the same as the risk for cancer in a solitary nodule. It's about 5%. Though if you've got 10 nodules in the multinodular goiter, the risk of cancer in any one of those nodules is less than it is in the solitary nodule. But overall, the chance of cancer being somewhere in that gland is about the same as the risk of cancer in the solitary nodule, about 5%. So what do you do when you have multiple nodules present? Well, you look at them by ultrasound. You identify those that are significantly large. And very importantly, not just the size, you also look at the nodules that have any suspicious features by ultrasound, hypervascularity, microcalcifications, irregular borders. So you choose nodules for further evaluation based on a combination of both size and ultrasound characteristics. Generally, we'll do a fine needle aspiration of any nodules that are significantly over a centimeter and a half, or any nodules approaching a centimeter or better, that have any suspicious ultrasound features. Now, there is a study that looks at what happens if you only evaluate the largest nodule and you don't pay any attention to the characteristics of the nodules. Well, if you do that and you only biopsy the very largest nodule and ignore all the rest, you can miss up to 30 to 50 percent of the cancers that might be present. All right, in our case, case, the first case here, TSH was normal, as was the free T4. Ultrasound was done, showed several nodules in the thyroid, but only one dominant or suspicious nodule that was in the right mid-pole that did correspond to what we had palpated on physical exam. Here's an ultrasound showing the, this is the thyroid here. This is a long axis view right here, probably the easiest one to see. And that's sort of the normal, sort of homogeneous, increased echo texture of normal thyroid tissue. And here you have a focal area of decreased echogenicity corresponding to the nodule. And here with Doppler on that nodule, you can see there's increased flow inside the nodule. And this makes the nodule a little more suspicious. Um, generally, most nodules, but nine nodules, generally have a little bit of flow in the periphery, but there won't be increased flow internally. So if you have more than three areas of internal flow, that's considered increased vascularity and raises your probability of thyroid cancer by at least a modest amount and, and would lead you to be more prone to evaluate that nodule further with FNA. So we did an FNA. There wasn't an indication for a thyroid scan because the TSH was normal. So this patient did not need a thyroid scan. We did the FNA, and the FNA showed an adequate sample, meaning there was at least several groups of at least six cells on at least a couple of the slides. And when we got back to cytology reading, it came back as indeterminate. And we said, great. So what do we do with that? So indeterminate in cytology terms means that it's not possible to tell whether that particular sample is cancer or not. It means there's some suspicion that it could be cancer, usually about a 20% probability in that situation, though it varies depending on the type of indeterminate reading you get. But with an indeterminate reading, you haven't ruled out cancer in, in, in general. And the most common cause of an indeterminate cytology reading, where you have an adequate sample and they're able to get a good look at it, but you just can't tell from the characteristics of the cells and the groups of cells whether or not it's cancer, the most common cause of that is follicular neoplasm. And we'll look at that a little more closely. So what do you do now? So as I said, the most common cause of indeterminate FNA cytology is follicular neoplasm. We get back indeterminate results about 20% of the time. About 70-75% of the time we get back a clear-cut benign reading. About 5% of the time we'll get back a malignant reading. About 5-10% to will be not able to determine because you didn't have an adequate sample. So with indeterminate or suspicious reading, particularly when it's due to follicular neoplasm, about 80% of those, if you take them out and look at them histologically, will be benign. But about 20% will be cancer. So that's the main limitation of FNA with a follicular neoplasm. You can't tell the difference between benign follicular adenoma and follic invasive follicular cancer on cytology. 
In the past, these patients were referred for surgery for definitive histologic diagnosis. So we had a fair number of patients we sent to surgery, the majority of which ended up being benign. So there's been a lot of work going on in the last 10 years trying to figure out are there other tests we can do to further narrow down the patients we send to surgery so we don't send so many people to surgery for benign nodules. In the past, we said repeat FNA wouldn't be helpful because once you got a suspicious reading on or indeterminate reading on cytology, you had to deal with that. And if, even if you got a repeat that showed benign, you still had to deal with the first reading. But now, with some additional testing available, it may be reasonable now to consider doing a repeat FNA on these patients if you use molecular testing. Now, this is still being worked out, but some of the experts in the field are beginning to recommend it. And there is one particular uh, test called the uh, MRA, M messenger RNA expression testing, varicytes of pharma test, um, which actually looks at messenger RNA profiling from 167 genes. And the, this test is fairly ingenious because it doesn't try to identify who has cancer. It tries to identify who does not have cancer. So you can better determine who doesn't need to go to surgery. So a study has been done, in fact several studies have been done on, the te on, the, on this particular test, but one of the best is a 19-month prospective multicenter study with 49 sites. They looked at almost 5,000 FNAs, uh, over 500 of which were indeterminate. They had 265 of them that met inclusion criteria, including having surgical histology on all these nodules. And so they looked at the testing with the messenger RNA profiling. Now, of these 265, 85 of them were malignant when they were taken out on final histology. And this messenger RNA profiling, which can be done on a fine needle aspiration. So just like when you do a fine needle aspiration, 25 gauge needle, you stick the nodule, you pull out a couple of few drops of fluid, and you put it into a media in a test tube, and you send it for messenger RNA testing, profiling. So it's a fairly straightforward test to do. You can do it on the same technique that you use for FNA cytology on, on the slides to look at. So they had 85 that were malignant, and the test correctly called 78 of those 85. Now, it wasn't perfect, but here's the important thing. Out of those that were indeterminate, either atypical or suspicious for follicular neoplasm, the negative predictive value, if you got a negative result, was about 95%. So it's not perfect, but it's, it's good to the point where most experts feel that if you get a negative result on this test, that it's reasonable to follow that patient clinically, recognizing that there is a small percentage of false negatives, but it's pretty good. The positive predictive value was not as good. So you're still sending some patients to surgery that don't have cancer, but you're cutting it down significantly. The positive predictive value was around 50%. Now, there is another test with molecular testing that actually looks at DNA. It actually looks at specific mutations in the DNA of genes that we know are associated with thyroid cancer. Uh, the RAS gene, uh, the BRAF, um, RET, uh, and PPAR gamma. And about 70% of thyroid cancers will have a specific mutation in one of those genes. The trouble is 30% of thyroid cancers do not have a mutation in those identified genes. So right now, testing for the DNA abnormalities has great specificity it's about seven, uh, 80 to 90 percent, but its sensitivity is still poor. So we probably we'll end up eventually using some combination of those two tests. The messenger RNA profiling, if that's negative, pretty much makes the possibility of cancer very small. The DNA testing, if it's positive, makes the probability of cancer quite high. And if you have positive DNA testing, then instead of just taking out the load with the nodule, since you know it's a high probability it's going to be cancer, you go ahead and do a total thyroidectomy so it can help with surgical planning. So there may be a role for both tests. So just, just wanted to let you know that those are coming down the pike and are going to change how we handle thyroid nodules with indeterminate results. Now our second case was that of a 60-year-old male who had a significantly large thyroid noted on physical exam, and it was noted after routine labs for his physical showed an abnormally low TSH. Now, we see that fairly often. You think, well, why, do, why would a patient have a low TSH? And there's a variety of causes of low TSH, but one of the most common is autonomy in the thyroid due to multinodular goiter. So anytime you see a low TSH, particularly if it's repeatedly low, and if you do a repeat TSH, it's still low, then one of the first things I would do, particularly in the absence of known pituitary disease, is to do a careful thyroid exam and look for any hint of multinodular goiter. 
Now this patient had some mild dysphagia. He said he felt like he was choking some of the time. He did not have shortness of breath or stride or a change in his voice. And he had not had any hyperthyroid symptoms. He did not have any history of radiation therapy to his head or neck. And his family history was negative for thyroid cancer. Physical exam showed that he was euthyroid appearing, didn't have any neck adenopathy, but his thyroid was significantly large. And there wasn't any specific dominant palpable nodule on exam, but the entire thyroid was irregularly enlarged. So here's just a picture of a significant gorda. This one's easy to see. And one of the first things we do on thyroid exam is we have a patient sit in a chair and swallow a little bit of water from a cup, and we look at them swallow. This one you don't need to swallow to see, but, but there's a significant goiter. Here's a typical ultrasound appearance of uh, multinodular goiter. Here's a trachea. This is a cross section of the neck. The patient's facing up, lying down on the table. Uh, right shoulder over here, left shoulder over here. Here's the thyroid. There's normal thyroid echo texture more in here. But this looks like Swiss cheese. And these hypoechoic areas, these areas of, that are darker, are multiple nodules scattered throughout. And these are all less than a centimeter. But this is a typical multinodular goiter appearance. So when we're faced with somebody with a multinodular, a patient with a multinodular goiter who has some local neck symptoms, then we've got to kind of drill down and figure out exactly what kind of symptoms are they having. We, we ask about dysphagia for either solid food or pills. We ask about pressure sensation or choking sensation, particularly when they lie down in bed at night. We ask about shortness of breath or unusual dyspnea on, uh, on exertion that doesn't have other explanation. Sometimes they just have local discomfort. It just doesn't feel good. Or sometimes they just don't like the way it looks. It can be cosmetic uh, complaints. And then we ask about hoarseness because if a gorda gets large enough, it may impact the recurrent laryngeal nerve and cause some chronic hoarseness. When we get significant or progressive hoarseness, we we'll always worry about the potential for invasion into local tissues, and that kind of heightens your suspicion that there could be malignancy going on. So how do we evaluate the patient that appears to have some local compressive symptoms in the neck or local pressure-type symptoms in the neck? Well, a good physical exam, of course, a good careful history. And then there's a couple of things we can do. Um, I like to, to look at a non-contrast CT of the neck. Now, particularly if the patient has a relatively low TSH, and particularly a partially suppressed TSH, I don't want to give them IV contrast if I can avoid it, because we know that IV contrast is iodinated, and that a large iodine load, particularly in a person with underlying thyroid autonomy, can precipitate a transient increase in the thyroid hormone production and cause transient hyperthyroidism known as the yod basedale effect. But a, a non-contrast CT is actually pretty good for looking at the thyroid, and it's very good for looking at what the effect of the thyroid is on the trachea, and I'll show you a couple of images of that in a moment. It also will help you fi figure out whether the, the goiter is going down substernally and going down into the chest, um, and it'll tell you whether you have tracheal deviation or tracheal compression. Now, you can do a functional study, not just PFTs or pulmonary function tests, but pulmonary function tests with a flow volume loop, and I'll show you a picture of that. The flow volume loop will identify for you whether or not you have evidence of extrathoracic obstruction, which you see with inspiration. And then you can get a barium swallow to evaluate dysphagia, of course. Now, here's a CT picture of a multinodular goiter. You can see the trachea is maybe deviated a little, but it's not, frankly, compressed at this point. But it gives you a very nice cross-sectional area of the trachea, and you can follow that down and see whether there's significant compression. Here's a CT of a multilogical goiter with sub, with, this is the chest, with sub-sternal uh, uh, extension down into the thorax. And here you can see the left lobe is, is quite asymmetrically enlarged. It's pushing the trachea over and beginning to compress the trachea a little bit. When I start to see this, then I'm, then I'm starting to talk to the patient more about, look, we need to go ahead and do something about this. We don't need to wait until you have stripe. And here's a flow volume loop. Here's a normal flow volume loop. The expiratory phase on top, the inspiratory phase on the bottom. Now this is it's a little tricky to look at because the, the y-axis here is not volume, but it's flow. All right. So this is the flow when you inspire. And normally you, you reach a nice peak flow and then it comes down as you get the lungs almost uh, completely filled up. But here with an extra thoracic obstruction, as a goiter would do in the neck, if it's compressing the trachea, you get a cutoff of the inspiratory phase of a flow volume loop. And that's worth knowing for your boards, I think. So if we see significant local symptoms, or we see tracheal compression, or cut off on the flow volume loop, then what's the best treatment? So my mentor taught me, he said, Al, he said, multinodular goiter, when it's symptomatic, particularly non-toxic multinodular goiter, when you don't have frank hyperthyroidism with it, is essentially a surgical disease. 
So the definitive treatment is surgery. And indeed it is. However, there are certain situations, particularly when the patient has waited and they're you know, 85, 90 years old, they've got multiple other medical problems, when it may be a little dicey about whether or not you want to send this patient to surgery or not, and we'll talk about options if you don't want to send them to surgery in just a moment. But the best treatment is surgery. Levothyroxin suppressive treatment does not work. It is, it is not effective. It has never been shown to really change the long-term natural history of multinodular goiter. And what you usually end up doing if you try to use this is make the patient hyperthyroid because they already got underlying autonomy. But what you want to do is find an experienced thyroid surgeon. As I tell my patients, thyroid surgery is not dangerous. You're not going into the chest or abdomen, but it's delicate. And you need somebody who knows what they're doing. So we have some very good thyroid surgeons here at uh, ECU. And, and we refer these patients to a good experienced thyroid surgeon and the proper procedure is a total or near total thyroidectomy. Now, the question arises is if you have like the one I showed you with the substernal extension where the goiter was essentially unilateral, if the goiter is just involved on in one side of the thyroid, which occasionally does, is unilateral surgery enough? Well, there are some studies to suggest it is. However, I can tell you, I have seen a lot of patients come back to me and years ago they had unilateral surgery for a goiter or enlargement on one side of the thyroid and now 10, 15, 20 years later, they're back with the same process on the other side, except now they're 75 or 80 years of age. And I'm saying, man, I wish you'd gotten this taken care of originally. Um, but there have been studies looking at what's the risk of recurrence if you do surgery, hemithyroidectomy, for unilateral goiter. And in general, these, there's a high rate of recurrence, but most of those recurrences are subclinical, at least during the period of time five years usually or less that these studies follow patients. But when I see them back 15 to 20 years later, they often have recurrence on the other side. So I'm not a big fan of unilateral surgery, though it may occasionally be indicated, particularly in the older patient. There is a lower risk of damage to the parathyroid glands or to the recurrent laryngeal nerve with unilateral surgery. So there are some potential advantages uh, for unilateral surgery in certain situations. Now, are there any alternatives to surgery in individuals who have uh, are very old or have multiple medical problems and just don't feel comfortable sending them to surgery? We know that for toxic multinodular goiter, when you have hyperthyroidism associated with the goiter, that I-131 is pretty effective. However, with non-toxic goiter, when the TSH is not suppressed, it's a little dicier as to whether or not I-131 can be effective. But there are some studies. It's been used for about two, two decades. Um, the original study was back, I think, in about 1989, 1990. It was a big report in annals uh, where they looked at about 40 patients um, with using uh, large doses of I-131 and non-toxic multinodular goiter. There was always a fear that if you treat these patients with I-131, you'll cause local inflammation, the goiter will suddenly get bigger, and their airway obstruction symptoms will suddenly increase and become critical. But that didn't happen. Um, basically, the patients tolerated I-131 very well. They got about a 40% reduction in total thyroid volume, so not complete normalization of the thyroid volume, but significant decrease within one year. It wasn't immediate. It took several weeks to start to decrease in size. The obstructive symptoms generally improved. Dyspnea improved in about 75% of patients, dysphagia in almost 90%, and the tracheal cross-sectional area did improve about 36%. Now, there are possible complications. About 3 to 13 percent will get some transient painful radiation thyroiditis that can be dealt with with analgesics. Um, about 5 percent will have transient hyperthyroidism, usually in the first couple of weeks. Usually that's very mild and, and mostly subclinical. None of the patients got into trouble. And hypothyroidism does occur not as frequently as it does when you treat Graves' disease with I-131 because these patients have patchy areas of increased activity in the gland and tend to take up the I-131 more in those areas that are hyperfunctioning. So they do get some long-term hypothyroidism, but it's less than 50% for just standard I-131 treatment. Now, the major drawback of I-131 treatment, besides the fact that it doesn't give you complete or completely reliable decrease in the size of the thyroid in all patients, is that a lot of these patients have very large goiters or their uptake, their 24-hour radioactive iodine uptake is low. So they don't take up much of the iodine you give them into the thyroid. And so if they're not taking much of that iodine up, you've got to give them a very large dose. And there, there is some suggestion that this is not proven, and, and not everybody agrees with this, but if when you give doses of 100 millicuries or greater, you may slightly increase the lifetime risk for secondary cancers. That's, that's controversial, but it may increase just a little bit. Certainly that's less significant in older patients, okay, because they have less length of time to live after you're treating them and less likely to have a, a long-term effect from it. 
Now, there are trials that have shown that pretreatment with thyrogen or recombinant TSH can augment the avidity with which the thyroid is taking up the iodine and give you a better treatment. And this has actually been looked at. It's not FDA approved for this purpose. Recombinant TSH is approved for treatment evaluation for thyroid cancer and for scanning for uh, following patients with thyroid cancer. But it has been used in, in studies looking at whether it could augment the effectiveness of I-131 treatment or make it better or allow you to lose lower doses. And, and these studies have shown that if you pre-treat the patient with a very small dose of recombinant TSH and then treat them with I-131, that your reduction in the volume size of the goiter improves further in a Compared to 40% for standard treatment, it improves another one-third to one-half better than standard treatment. So it allows for more effective treatment for very large goiter, and it allows you to treat even those patients that have poor radioactive iodine uptake, less than 20%. The side effects are very low when the dose is kept very low. Now, we use 0.9 milligrams in our patients with thyroid cancer, but that's patients who've had their thyroid taken out. So if you're given TSH, recombinant TSH, you're going to stimulate whatever thyroid tissue is there. So they, they mostly have looked at smaller doses, and it's interesting, even the very smallest doses augment thyroid hormone uptake by 50%. And it really doesn't matter whether you use 0 0.03, 0 0.1, or 0 0.3. They all increase it by about 50%. But we do know that if you go up over 0 0.1 milligrams, if you go up to 0 0.3, you get more significant increase transiently in the size of the goiter because you're stimulating it with TSH. So in that situation, when you use in the studies that have used larger doses, 0.3 milligrams or greater, they've got to have seen almost a 10% increase in goiter size at 24 hours and a 24% increase at 48 hours, and that can be significant. If the patient's already got near critical symptoms, that can be a problem. The size tends to come back to baseline though within one week and then starts to decrease. You can see transient elevations of thyroid hormone a little more so than you do with standard treatment that without recombinant TSH, with just standard I-131 treatment. But most of these patients still, even though they get transient increase in T4 and T3 in the first week, most of them are still subclinical. And there is a little bit higher risk of painful thyroiditis when you pretreat with recombinant TSH. Okay, our last case, this is just a brief one. This is a 62-year-old female who presented with hyperthyroid symptoms. This is a patient referred to me from internal medicine clinic by one of the residents. She had a complicated history. Coumadin treatment, mechanical aortic valve, osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes. But the big thing is she was on Coumadin. So, you know, I was hoping that we wouldn't have any nodules that we had to do FNA on, but if we have to, we can deal with that. She had a paternal grandmother that had a very large goiter, and it's not unusual. A lot of these multinodular goiter patients, as I alluded to earlier when I was talking about the pathophysiology, will have family history of goiter that runs in their family. Um, she was a non-smoker. She only drank alcohol rarely. She, her, she was a little bit tachycardic. She did appear to be mild or hyperthyroid as she wasn't toxic appearing. Her thyroid was in regu irregularly enlarged. I did not palpate any distinct dominant nodule. Her TFTs were clearly in the hyperthyroid range. Thyroid ultrasound showed a moderately enlarged gland. Lots of nodules in the half centimeter to one and a half centimeter range. None with suspicious features. Now, Earlier in the first case, I asked you, did, did we need to do a thyroid scan? And the answer was no, because the TSH was normal. But here you have a suppressed TSH, and in fact you have a patient that's clinically hyperthyroid, so certainly you're going to get a thyroid scan and a 24-hour radioactive iodine uptake. And as I like to emphasize to the residents that rotate with me, some of you have rotated with me and you know this, I want to make sure that every resident that leaves here knows the difference between a thyroid scan and a 24-hour radioactive iodine uptake. Thyroid scan is the picture you see tells you the functional characteristics of palpable abnormalities of the gland. So that's the image. The radioactive iodine uptake is a number, quantitative number that tells you how avid the gland is for iodine. So if you give a certain amount of iodine, how much of it is going to end up in that gland? That's your 24-hour uptake. So we did both. Her uptake was significantly increased. This is typical for hyperthyroidism caused by either multinodular goiter or Graves' disease. The scan was heterogeneous, typical for multinodular goiter. There were areas of increased and decreased tracer uptake. But luckily, and I was uh, breathe this eye relief, all the areas of where there were focal nodules approaching a centimeter and a half, all those areas corresponded to areas of increased activity on the scan. I'll show you a picture of the scan in a moment. So this patient, we went ahead and treated her with radioactive iodine. She didn't require a very high dose, 100 millicure range, because she was hyperthyroid and she had significantly increased radioactive iodine uptake. So it was much easier to treat her with radioactive iodine. She got 16 millicuries and her T4 normalized after uh, six weeks or so. 
Not only did her T4 normalize, I mean, the primary reason I treated her was for hyperthyroidism, but she also had significantly large thyroid. When we did a follow-up thyroid ultrasound, the thyroid was significantly decreased in size after that effective treatment. Now, interestingly, she then became hyperthyroid again within a year later. And so what did we do? We treated her again. And this time we said, all right, 16 millicuries, you know, knocked you down up against the ropes and you shook off and came back at us. We're going to hit you harder this time. So we gave her 30 millicuries and she became hypothyroid. I think she'll probably remain permanently hypothyroid at this point. We have her own levothyroxine. There's a picture of the scan. You can see it's heterogeneous. There's an area of increased uptake here, maybe a little bit increased here and here. All right, let's just do a quick recap. So if you don't remember anything else from today, I want you to remember that there are three main clinical issues for multinodular goiter. Is it causing local compressive symptoms or is it likely to in the near future? Is it autonomous or hyperfunctioning? Is it going to put the patient at risk from cardiac or bone standpoint? And could it be cancer? So again, to, to emphasize the cancer risk, 5%. If you have multiple nodules that are suspicious, evaluate them based on not only size but also ultrasound characteristics and do more than just the largest nodule. So when do we treat? We treat if there are local neck symptoms, if there's evidence of hypothyroidism or significant autonomy we think is putting the patient at cardiac or bone risk, if there's a very large goiter or a very large nodule, even if the biopsy is negative, I tell the patient what it now that we're dealing with the possibility of sampling error and we may not have a fully sensitive test. So I said the writing's on the wall. If this thing's gotten this big, you're in pretty good shape right now. Let's go ahead and get it treated. So sometimes I'll refer to patients even before they get symptoms, even if they don't have a suspicious biopsy, but it's a clinical decision there. If there's a significant substernal component, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to have surgery, but if there's a nodule in that substernal component, you can't evaluate that with FNA. So if you have suspicious nodule and substernal component, that's an indication for surgery. And then if the TSH is fully or near fully suppressed or if clinical hyperthyroidism is present, you certainly treat them, and I-131 is a good option there. When can you follow the patient? Well, if they don't have any of those symptoms or problems. It's certainly reasonable to follow them. How do you follow them? You want to get periodic follow-up physical exam, periodic follow-up imaging by ultrasound. Maybe uh, some of my patients that, that have had a little bit of deviation of the trachea but not actual frank compression, and what I'll do in a very large border, and I said, look, I really think you ought to have this out, and they refuse, which they often do. I said, no, it's not bothering me, doc. I think I'll just wait and see how it does. But those patients, I'll usually bring them back, and I'll usually repeat some cross-sectional imaging of the neck every few years and just see if it's progressing. Certainly, if they develop new symptoms, we evaluate it. And then you've got to follow the thyroid function test. I recommend doing repeat levels in about six months. If they're staying stable, we check them at least yearly. When should you refer to patients? We certainly would like to see these patients if they have a TSH approaching 0.1 or full suppression, certainly if they're hyperthyroid, or we'll help you with treatment. You don't necessarily have to refer them to us, but in the resident clinic, if you'd like to talk to us about how to approach the treatment, you'd like to arrange it in your clinic, we'll certainly assist you with that, or we'll be glad to see the patient. If the patient has local compressive neck symptoms or evidence of airway compression, they should see, I think, both an endocrinologist and a good thyroid surgeon. And then if there are any nodules that may merit fine needle aspiration evaluation, certainly referring them to an endocrinologist is reasonable. Again, to recap the treatment options, I-131 is a great treatment option if they're hyperthyroid. It is a reasonable treatment option if they have local compressive symptoms and you really don't think they're a surgical candidate. Surgery, though, is the best treatment if they have local neck symptoms or if you suspect cancer. We didn't talk about antithyroid drugs, but antithyroid drugs do have a role, particularly for temporary treatment of thyroid toxic patient that also has other reasons why they might need surgery on the thyroid. So you prepare that patient and get them into a euthyroid state with antithyroid drugs while you're awaiting surgery. Um, I've got some very elderly patients with borderline hyperthyroidism that very fragile, a lot of things going on. Some of them I've given them antithyroid drug treatment temporarily just to see how they do for a little bit if I normalize the TSH. And if I'm having to persistently continue to treat them with I-131, then I talk to them, I'm sorry, persistently treat them with antithyroid drug treatment, then I'll talk to them about definitive treatment with I-131. And you can also use methimazole or antithyroid drugs if you've got a patient with multinodular goiter who has to get a CT scan with contrast for some other reason. Particularly if they're fragile, they already got a TSH near 0.1, and you don't think they would tolerate even transient hyperthyroidism. You can prevent it by treating with low-dose methimazole for about three months. Levothyroxine, as I emphasized earlier, is not recommended. The only exception to that is if you have a modest multinodular goiter with an elevated TSH, and then it would be reasonable to give a course of levothyroxine replacement therapy.
So that concludes my talk. I've got some, uh, a number of sources here that are available to you, uh, and they will be available online. Uh, and then I'll take any questions that you might have.